Ah, finally home after a long day's work. Time to boot up my favorite online multiplayer game. We've all had these moments, immediately followed by a string of colorful language targeted towards the game's developers. With that said, it's really easy to get lost in the sauce and lose the big picture on how difficult it really is to maintain these kinds of systems. According to this very reliable Google AI overview, 76% of all adults in the United States have played video games on one platform or another, and that number is even higher globally. These players, whether they know it or not, are exposed to some really complex computer systems every time they log on. Multiplayer in particular is one of the most complex. You have to manage tens of thousands of clients at a time, as well as their state in relation to one another and a ton of ancillary services that support different types of gameplay loops. Now for this video, it would be no fun talking about a single player game since for the most part, they don't have any required network services to function. <coughs> oh, sorry, I don't know what that was. Anyways, we'll be talking about a very simplified version of some of the systems that go into some of these live service games. My drug of choice was League of Legends for a long time. So that's what I'll be basing some of the player scenarios around. However, it should be noted that the content and principles in this video will apply to the majority of different networked services, not just games. Anyways, let's get into a bit of the software architecture that supports some of our favorite live services and games. Just like when they spam the enter key, League of Legends players' behavior is very predictable. Since this is the case, we can build behavioral playbooks to test the different common services offered by League. Core services for a game like this could include queuing up for a match, playing the match, checking the match history after the fact, and then checking your personal profile and rank. Now let's cover some of the high level computer science that goes into getting a player from the queue up button to reading their end of match results and subsequent post game match history. I will cover some of the basic thought processes of what could go into architecting a system like this, as well as some of the trade-offs that can be made along the way. Before we can even start looking into the actual game services, all game clients have some sort of heartbeat to check the client's connectivity. This is used so that the backend only sends updates to active clients, thereby greatly limiting compute waste. This is also probably the most simple part of the process. A heartbeat service will simply send a ping to your client checking when the last time the player performed some sort of action in the client. If that time is longer than some sort of arbitrary set time, they'll show you as AFK and set your status as away. When the player returns, we resume the updates. Cloud compute is really expensive and good engineers always find interesting ways to limit that kind of expense as much as possible without hurting the user experience. The first step is to hit the queue up button. Regardless of the type of client used, it will most likely send a specialized request to some sort of matchmaking service. The request will contain the roles the player selected, their personally identifiable player identification number, and any other game-specific info required by the matchmaking service. It is important to note that we will not have the client send critical information to the matchmaking service. That kind of information should not be managed by the client due to security and exploitation concerns. An example could be that if we handled rank information on the client for whatever reason, a malicious actor could alter the data their client sends out pertaining to the rank of that account, making it look like they are in a rank that they are not really. It also makes it much easier to secure and validate data the closer it is to your backend. Edge and client security is an ongoing topic worthy of its own video. 
From here, the player information will enter some sort of temporary database. Now, the database for a service like this needs to be capable of a few things. It's got to be very fast, be able to handle atomic transactions and store simple data. We don't need any sort of wild cross table joins or queries or anything. So some sort of relational database is probably a little overkill for this step. An in-memory key value store could probably do a really good job for this step. Something like Redis, for example, could work well with a bit of tweaking. The reason for these requirements is because the database's rate of transactions per minute will be very high. Players will be entering and exiting the queue all the time. So accommodating that for this kind of service is a must for performance and stability. That matchmaking service will then interact with this database to find a full team of players, including the initial player, where each player adheres to some sort of constraint. A very simple one is finding players relatively close in rank, but players can also be matched on things like latency to the game server, role type selected, and whatever game specific factors the developer chooses to select for. Now matchmaking in and of itself can get very complex. Entire sections of mathematics like graph theory seek to help with these kinds of problems. I'll link a great intro video on graph theory by Reducible down in the description. Once 10 players are matched, the list of players will then be sent to a game server service. A match is then spawned, and the players on the list are then whitelisted, allowing them to connect to that match and only those players. Those 10 players also need to be notified that a match has been found, so the matchmaking service will then send a message to them saying, hey, we found you a game, here's the game ID you need to connect to. The clients then send a connection request to the game server service. Once the full lobby of players is connected to that specific game ID, a game server process is spun up to handle the match that gets played out. Once the match is complete, a large data dump containing the match data is generated by the game process, and that data has to go to a few places. The first is the match data needs to go to a match history database that we query when a player wants to see the data for their recently played matches. The second is general game metadata, which will be used in referencing the match data and for general traceability. The last is telemetry and logs on how the game server performed for future analysis, help with business decisions, and for incident response. I hate saying it depends, but when it comes to things like this, it, it's heavily situational the type of data that you choose to collect. There could be business or game analysis reasons for filtering for the type of data that you are, or there could be compliance or regulatory reasons. Anyways, that data is gonna be shuttled around to a few databases and an end of match screen with some of the data will be displayed to the player's clients. Up until now, I've covered how a couple of services can handle a few thousand players, depending of course. Sharding and auto-scaling is how we take that same tech and make it scale to a few million players. One of my favorite papers related to the matter is Scalability and Load Testing for Valorant by Keith Gunning over at Riot Games. Shards are bundles of services that will be deployed all over the world and handle individual pockets of players in different geolocations. That bundle of services is then automatically scaled up or down based off of the current active player count. The benefit of this kind of setup is that the game servers are technically located closer to the players themselves, drastically reducing player latency. This also makes it so that if there is a problem with a specific server or geolocation because of like a natural disaster or something, there is not a single point of failure where your entire platform goes down. The downside, however, is that these kinds of deployments are much more complex to develop, maintain, and troubleshoot. Making this kind of infrastructure work properly will require standardized automated deployments and robust logging. Otherwise, it's very easy for the complexity to overtake you. If we have people freestyling networked services without any proper log management, 
then the deployments are basically black boxes. and We don't know what's going on inside of them, which is dangerous at worst and irresponsible at best. A very core thing that we haven't covered related to all of these services is how they actually communicate with each other. When it comes to communication formats, there are a bunch, but we're only going to cover two main ones. The first, JSON, which is a loosely typed text-based format, and the second, which is a strongly typed binary format called protobuf. Some of y'all might have not heard about that one, but don't worry, we're going to go over both of them, their differences, and why you might choose one over the other. For JSON, what do I mean when I say loosely typed text-based format? Let's break it down. There are two main components to communication formats, and that's text-based versus binary-based, and strongly typed versus loosely typed. There are a ton more things to take into consideration, but for now, let's stick to these two. Text-based formats need to be parsed per request, meaning for every request, there is a step your computer takes to sort of translate what is in the body to something the server can actually use. Over the wire, all that's being sent over is text, raw characters, and it's up to the recipient to decode that text into a JSON body. JSON is also loosely or implicitly typed. There is no formal system in place saying that this value is an integer, this value is a string, this value is a boolean, and so on. Some of the benefits of something like JSON is that it's very easy to prototype with, highly compatible with almost any service or tool, and is human readable, even though that's arguable if you've seen any sufficiently complex JSON object. To give you an idea, a single JSON object for a single match of League of Legends is around 3,600 lines on average. Some of the downsides is that, especially for high speed or high capacity systems, it can be slow due to the fact that it can be computationally heavy to parse every single request the way that JSON requires. It is also inherently prone to type-based problems due to the way that it handles types or lack thereof. Protobuf, on the other hand, is a bit different. It's strongly typed and is in a binary format. Unlike JSON, there is something you have to do before you can start using protobufs. Protobuf has a special .proto file that you have to specify the forms of the messages that are going to be sent and received. This is also where the strict typing system comes into place. When we reference these structs, we have to adhere to the types they contain, thus adding type safety to our communication. The protobuf data is sent over the wire in a binary format, which computers don't have to constantly encode and decode the way they have to do with JSON. Protobuf data looks like a bunch of hexadecimal if you view it through a network sniffer like Wireshark. Whereas for JSON, you're basically just going to see plain text. One of the obvious pros is performance. Since we don't need to constantly serialize and deserialize the request bodies we are sending and receiving like with JSON, we can achieve many more operations per second. There's this mutual understanding between the sender and the receiver of what kind of data is expected, so that step is basically removed in the communication process. Another pro is the benefit of knowing that there's going to be consistency with your types. When it comes to working on a sufficiently large project, that cannot be taken for granted. A slew of security vulnerabilities and difficult to debug runtime problems can also be avoided with strongly typed communication formats and languages. Nothing is perfect. A trade-off you have to make is whenever you need to change your network message format, you will need to rebuild all of your .proto files for the relevant services. Using protobuf also requires that you manage another file in your project. When the project is small, it's not a problem to add a dependency. But again, when the project starts to get larger and larger, then adding more points of complexity will make maintaining the software harder going forward. It's just something to take note of. Now, we covered services that contribute to the core gameplay loop for a very simple multiplayer game. 
Depending on the circumstance, real world games have a ton more services that handle things like battle pass progression, loadout selection, in-game store, player communication systems, and so on. This is also not mentioning a ton more technical things required to deploy something like this in real life, like load balancing, service level caching, network security, client security, anti-cheat, network optimizations, the game server executables themselves, and any technical testing whatsoever. Suffice it to say, technical teams like the ones at Riot Games are superheroes for developing, maintaining, and securing some of the most complex systems on the planet. <laughs> they went so far as to basically make their own internet. Researching this stuff was a ton of fun, especially considering I wrote my own versions of similar simplified live services with a bunch of simulated users, microservices, and all that. If you would like a video on that or anything else mentioned in this video, post a comment and I'll be sure to check it out. Thanks for making it to the end and see you in the next one.